Yes, I'm F. What is it? Oh, I'll go. The director who is now at the first floor lift lobby is talking to Tin and Sopwa and uh, he says that the, um, well I let him I let you let him speak you speak to him uh, personally. Yeah, it's David Ang's executive director of this place. He cancelled my event the last minute. So the person I should be Okay, so this is the gentleman who cancelled our event. So these are just an example of the troves of people who have to be relocated elsewhere today. Uh, and extra, yeah, 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 yeah. What is the name? My name is David. David. No, 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 he's in breach of contract. Yeah, yeah. And he has his own version of what he thinks, you know, the situation is. Okay, so Mr. Ang. Do you know that I have to leave my son at home just to want to attend to find out more? Now. The explanation is very straightforward. We were not aware of the booking and for this particular event and the nature of the event. No, 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 I don't, I, I, I don't want to go into that. Why is it that you're cancelling it? Because our premises is meant for learning purposes and there shouldn't be any political or trade union activity on our premises. Basically that. Um, I like to work, I'm so sorry about that. Why? Why can't we have here? Yeah, we are too far away. I'm somebody in the room. I want to listen to what's going on. And it's so last minute. minute. It is so last minute. I mean, like we keep all the way here. You know, there's such a thing going on in Singapore or in any part of the world that you can do last minute cancellation. Is are you being pressured by any by the authorities to do such things? Are you being pressured? No. Who are you? No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just for a part. I'm just for a No, no. I'm just for a part. That our premises are not meant for any activity relating to a political uh, discussion on the on the chain. That's it. That's it. Sound like a sports bar, but this, I have to say this, uh, this is a private event. So if you're here staying in this room and you're not invited by us, I would ask you to leave. Uh, I always told my, tell my friends, you know, Malaysia is 15, maybe even 20 years ahead of us in terms of uh, the growth of civil society, in terms of the democratic development, in terms of the growth of the political parties. Uh, but I think after this GE, I think we've caught up a little bit, you know. So, but after today, I think maybe we're not. She's considered the most prominent woman in Cambodia's uh, political opposition. She spent 18 years in exile. And when she returned to Cambodia in 1989, she served as, a, as advisor on women's affairs to the then and now Prime Minister Hun Sen. In 1998, she was elected to the Cambodian National Assembly. Uh, she ran for a parliamentary seat in the northwest of Cambodia, which was then the, uh, and probably now still the most devastated region uh, after the war. And she won. Uh, in that year, uh, she became the Minister of Women and Veterans Affairs as one of only two women to join the cabinet. But guess what? In 2004, she stepped down from her role as minister citing corruption as a major obstacle to her work. And almost immediately, she jumped ship to the opposition. She transferred her allegiance to the Sam Ramsey party, where she is deputy head of the steering committee. And then she became a member of parliament for the Sam Ramsey party, as well as a member of the steering committee. And in 2009, so this is interesting, uh, she sued Prime Minister Hun Sen for defamation after claiming that the Premier had uttered a de derogatory statement against her during the press conference. And guess what? The Prime Minister sued her back. <laughs> and of course, she lost. Uh, then, the administration legislators then suspended the parliamentary immunity for Sukho. So she has lost all her parliamentary immunity. And then, uh, guess what? Uh, the lawyer who represented her was forced to defect to the ruling party in return for dropping the charges against him. 
uh, a lawsuit was dismissed by the appeal court on uh, 14 October 2009, and Hansen uh, succeeded. And in August 2009, the, the court found Suko guilty of defamation in order to pay approximately 4,000 US dollars in fines and compensation. I was just to say that it was about my trial. I pulled out of the courthouse. What we, I was holding is the symbol of my party, the candle. To symbolize justice. This is one man, one woman against the ruler of Cambodia, Prime Minister of Cambodia, who has ruled Cambodia for 30 years. And this is me. This is the crowd that I gather. For 15 months, we went on and on. These are the parliamentarians from the opposition party, and that's Sanasi, our leader. We took the front line in order to show that we are in control. The opposition is in control of the streets, of the situation, and that is the agenda that we find. Same thing. <laughs> we all have what Tian was talking about, right? The opposition fighting and all that. How do we come together? You have Alex giving us all the theories, and then you have practice. <laughs> That's why I keep telling it's a more, more, more severe form of democracy. Fighting, yeah, really, it is at this level in the city, members of parliament, dressed as members of parliament, we have uh, symbols and all that, we fight at the street level. But in reality, this part is really not difficult, it's normal. We get arrested, they don't arrest us anyway. They don't want to arrest me because they would give me too much publicity. It's not like you. They, they want to arrest you. But with us, with us, they don't want to arrest us because it would give us too much publicity. It's a big how? Because we have, and because this is the role of women in politics and the global networks of women in politics. I mean, you, you come from, uh, you know, Cambodia to Singapore. What did that incident, what, what feeling did it give you? That was not news to me. In Cambodia, it would happen. It happens every day. They crack down, all that. But, you know, I'm going to disappoint you, Democrats of Singapore. <laughs> really, I'm going to be frank, like Alex was frank with you. Why didn't you stand up? Why did you call? Why did you come together and stand there? Why did you move away? Hi, my I'm George Palmer. Um, I've got some questions. George, maybe people put the questions up. Oh, okay. That was my reaction. If I were at home, I would have called. I know it's very different. I know it's different. But. My gut feeling. Yeah, you'll be arrested. Yeah, of course you'll be arrested. Look, I was look, look at the like, look at what I we go through every day, every day the scene. It's because the police say that we are uh, what legal. They will say everything. They will they will give you a book of law. This this thick. Here, one question is a uh, legal. Yes, I know. <laughs> you the so is here. Yeah. Yeah. So is yeah. It used to be five, but you apparently now it's one no. person and you can like, fear, you know. Here, here actually, fear. Uh, there's no fear, but it's an entrenched system. No, I think, I think we, perhaps we need to reflect. I think subconsciously, we also want to make it as a status quo. Status quo? We also want to make it a status quo, right? You would lose your job, right? You would go to jail. It goes to... I 
would do, I, this would happen to me, this would happen to me, would this would happen to me. Mm -hmm. It will. But the so Singaporean in general will say that we are fools to do that. It is, sure. Cambodian citizens who have already given the stake of their lives, they say these are fools. Why do you do things like that? The government will just take you and that's the end of you. Why? Why are you going to do that? Do you care what they say? Oh, the message. No, 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 no. Then you're stuck. Uh, sorry, let, let me then just you're stuck. put this point here. Can we, can we, the system uh, is different. Sorry, I have to bash in here. The okay. system okay. is system different is anywhere. Different. Everywhere. But if you fight for this, if you fight for this, you don't think our system is, is less, you think our system is, is more liberal than this? Look at what you have. If I were to say, I'm a member of one, if I were to say, I'm, I can't take this guy to court, although he called me a prostitute. He went on TV, he went on for days. Yeah, I'm going to say, oh, I can't take him because he's a member, prime minister. If I can't go to court, I don't have a lawyer. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. You are saying to the village, how are you going to say, what are you going to say to the villagers? That you are better? Are you, they stand up first and we will stand up later? It's that chain. It's not about what if. It's about this is not fair. This is not just. This is not the life I want to live. That's what it is. Otherwise, you'll be sitting here. Sorry, that's a challenge to you. I know the system is...
this, I decided to allow myself to be abused and bullied into writing tracks of self-incriminating lies and half-truths. It seemed less painful to surrender in the, in the interrogation room, but it was more painful and when I was put back into the cell. There I would shed tears, stemming from my sense of utter powerlessness, loss of self-esteem, and constant worry over how my quote-unquote confession would harm others. The government onslaught resulted in three years of imprisonment, five years of restriction orders, a fine of $87,000, and other painful consequences for me and my family. Uh, Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, it is a good follow up, actually, to, uh, to our first one. Uh, this thing, actually, about being traumatized and being fearful.
it was there that I decided that uh, I have to speak up. But again, I tell you, I was frightened. I was still frightened of being re-arrested because I was made a real leader when actually I was not. Anyway, I decided actually to uh, compose some of the writings that I did. I have to tell you actually that in prison I wrote a journal, but uh, I had to destroy it, unfortunately, uh, because uh, I heard from my lawyer that uh, Sola, Sola, who was released, I think, a few weeks before me, you know, had all her writings and her drawings, her artwork, confiscated, actually, upon release. So I didn't want, actually, my journal to go into the hands, actually, of the ISD. So I destroyed it. Uh, but I kept records actually of certain dates and, and, and uh, keywords that I wanted to remember later on. Uh, another thing I learned actually when I came out actually from uh, uh, detention was that I was trying actually to forget about the whole thing. The ISD also was very happy, they wanted me to forget about the whole thing. And so it never existed. And, uh, but then because I was doing uh, massage work, so some of these clients would maybe recognize me and ask me, you know, are you that Vincent Cheng? So I had to give an explanation. So instead actually of talking about whether I'm Marxist or not, what is liberation theology, blah, blah, blah. I went straight to explain about how I was treated and being in prison. So I would tell them stories of how I was beaten up and, and the whole room and so on. And I always find that I'm able actually to turn these people to my side actually, when you tell them exactly how you were treated. Because they will be shocked. They will be shocked at how this can happen in Singapore. How could Lee Kuan Yew, you know, that great man, do this? You know, I remember, I remember when I was uh, uh, treating this uh, AIDS patient, you know, and he was dying and I was massaging his feet and all that. And then he asked me why I was doing this and all that. Then it led to my revealing to him that I was uh, uh, in prison uh, under the ISA. And then uh, I told him that I was beaten. And then suddenly he shouted, oh, Lee Kuan Yew, you bastard! <laughs> oh, I, I was really shocked. You know? And his godfather went out of the kitchen, what happened, what happened, what happened? You know? So you see, things like that, uh, I, I, I find that uh, sometimes, uh, not sometimes, uh, we ex-detainees, we have to speak up. I think that is the first step. Most of the time, we are so traumatized, we all keep silent. And most of our ex uh, ISD detainees, whether they are from the 50s, 60s, 70s, right? everybody have been keeping silent. Is that we, what I want? I think it's the trauma. It's the trauma actually that is preventing us from speaking up. So we have to break out. We have to break out. And I think the first step is I think we have to open our mouth. Or if we are afraid, actually, you know, to speak publicly, then maybe we should write. We should keep a record, actually, of all that actually we're going through, you know. And then later on, maybe at an opportune time, we can actually have that as we share to the people of Singapore. That's one. Okay. Secondly, I think that uh, it's very important is that you cannot work alone. I think we have to work together. We have to work together. If we want to abolish the ISA, we want to uh, call for the truth and reconciliation commission, you know, or whatever, we have to work together. I think we have got to uh, get a lot of our differences actually and work focusedly actually on what we want to achieve.
So I think this process of democratization, if I put it in a very simplistic way, is that first of course you need people who have conscience, who 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 have the courage to speak out, to consistently put out your cause. These are we have seen everywhere. You know, the civil society, the voice of conscience, even in the most repressive situation, we find, you know, you have Aung San Suu Kyi, you have all this, this type of people. I'm just trying to share that there is a certain optimism that I and many of Malaysia's, uh, uh, what is it called, activists are sharing now. We say, because now what we're fighting for is being publicly recognized. Now the question is, we have to compete to show that. We are more competent than the ruling party to run the show. Everybody so because they have so much baggage in in uh, Najib's camp that they are not able to deliver. So we are not worried is that such, such. Just that we have to overcome public public prejudice. We have to overcome the gyasu attitude of our own public, and rightly so. In democracy, that's how it is because they are our boss. They have to decide. We cannot go around and scold them. Why are you so kiasu? Of course, they, they are our boss. They kiasu. We have to 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 assure them. If you're kiasu, you better vote for us. Because if not, you will lose your future. Because this group of people are running the show that doesn't know what they are doing, and they are going to lose you. My agenda is human rights. I have no intention of overthrowing the PAP government. If the PAP government delivers me the human rights, I'll vote for them. It's as simple as that. All right. So I'm going to talk only about the agenda. Referring to the elections that um, Martin mentioned, um, it's already fading from memory very fast because uh, of uh, you. You see, like today, uh, things are back to. Normal. After the announcement about ISA repeal in Malaysia, there was this 24 hours an announcement that no, 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 we're not going to change. Everything is hunky dory in Singapore. Things are back to normal. But you know, even during the elections, uh, I was um, not particularly enthusiastic about some opposition parties, and people seem to assume from my blog. I am pro opposition, and I always tell them, "Don't be ridiculous. I'm not. Uh, I only have the agenda. There are some parties which are closer to my agenda, which is that all my sympathies and sympathies and support go to. Uh, but some parties are not. So today, I'm going to talk strictly about the agenda. I'm really not going to talk about opposition or politics because there are two great experts here. Since I have never participated in opposition or politics, I have no intention whatsoever. You can see that to realize democracy, you need to have these building blocks, which are very simply the human, the core human rights. You can't have meaningful democracy without meaningful equality of political weight, and you can't have meaningful equality of political weight without these human rights. That is your, your that is your intellectual linkage between human rights and democracy. You can't have one without the other. Electoral democracy, or which comes first? <coughs> Electoral democracy or civil rights and human rights? And the funny thing is that if you look at history, James maybe will disagree with me, I don't know, but he, he, he often does, which I enjoy. Um, if you look historically, most countries went considerable distance down this road first before they went to democracy. They establish your freedoms, your liberties, and the rule of law first. And then gradually created democracy as we recognize it today. Right? I mean, to some extent, it went in tandem, but um, that's how. Even in Hong Kong, they still don't have democracy in Hong Kong. But I think in many ways, Hong Kong is far better than a lot of Southeast Asian ASEAN countries when it comes to this. So it's quite possible to have the second, which would make me happy because that's the agenda that I have, <laughs> without the first, which I couldn't want, I'm not too concerned about that. Well, I, the way I look at it, 
I look at op there are different opposition parties, but they are not all the same. Just because you're all equally anti-PAP does not make you all equally the same to me, because the way I look at it, I look at opposition parties that have a strong commitment to human rights and those that don't. And to me, when, when it's this kind of thing, it's really a case of another potential autocrat trying to replace that autocrat. So at the end of the day, uh, the, what difference does it make? The same thing happened just a week ago to the youth leader of our party because he went to defend the villagers whose houses were being demolished. That is fighting for democracy in Cambodia. <laughs> What's your reaction? Oh. Same thing. Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> we all have what Tian was talking about, right? The opposition fighting and all that. How do we come together? You have Alex giving us all the theories. And then you have practice. 